this was probably one of the first population-based uh, studies of deaths in a, in a region. It was in San Francisco. They did autopsies on everyone who died for a period of a year. About just over 400 people died. And they looked at why people died and when they died. And, and the when turned into this trimodal death distribution that I'm sure you've all heard of. It's in ATLS and has been forever. This led directly to organized trauma care across the world, but certainly that's what started it off in, in America. That was in the 1970s, and uh, after that, America developed uh, organized trauma systems. And about 20 years later, um, uh, Dimitriades and his team in Los Angeles repeated a very similar study over three years, so a lot more patients, about 4,000 patients, and they looked at the same thing. And what they found was that a uh, third peak had gone. And this is because, really, of the effectiveness of those trauma systems. That uh, you know, you've got patients into organized trauma systems, and those late deaths disappeared, and actually the early deaths started dropping. But what you probably notice, if I can find it, is still 50% of these deaths were, were happening uh, before patients even got into hospital. So what we wanted to do, and what I'm going to show you, is we wanted to have a look at all the deaths that occurred in this London trauma system across a two-year period. Everyone who died across two years, we tracked them down, all their autopsy reports. If they died in hospital, we got all the records from the hospital, and we put it all together. And overall, over two years, we saw just over 3,000 patients, so 1,500 patients a year. And out of those 3,000, 500 people ultimately died from their injuries. That's a lot. That's one in six people that we were seeing on the air ambulance dies from the, their injuries. And then we went on. We wanted to see three things, really. We wanted to see why these people die where they die, the setting they die in, and the timing of their deaths. Because that really is all information you need to know to de decide how you uh, allocate your resources and where you focus your research attention and, and your efforts. And this is what we found. Okay, So for those 500 deaths over two years, about 40% of them were due to uh, central nervous system injuries. There's hemorrhage. Here's the, the head injuries. This 6% here... That's head injuries and hemorrhage mixed together. And the next biggest group, this 8% here, is injuries that we call incompatible with life. These are patients who fit our ambulance services criteria for being able to be declared dead. I, mean, I won't go through them. They basically decapitation, hemicorporectomy, that kind of stuff. Um, little spattering down the end here. Of, uh, I've lumped them all together, and the yellow is... Um, I've put it down as ventilatory failure, but it's airway uh, problems, um, asphyxia, traumatic asphyxia, tension pneumothorax, and the cardiac tamponades. And a very small little group over here of multi-organ failure. Now, so that's why people in London died over two years. It's um, not very different to this study. Uh, this is a really a seminal American study, also a population-based study, one of the few. This is the study that everyone uses to um, uh, cite the fact that 40% of people die from hemorrhage. And they, they showed exactly what we showed. About 40% die from brain injuries, 40% from hemorrhage, and about 6% are brain injuries and hemorrhage. And interestingly, it's exactly the same as Donald Trunkey showed in the very first uh, a study in the 1970s, and the same as what Dimitriades showed in, in New York. So this hasn't changed. But then we wanted to look at where these deaths actually were happening. And this, this is where our, our analysis was interesting. So we classified uh, or defined uh, the place you died as being pre-hospital or in-hospital as where you had your first cardiac arrest. And we did this because really your only opportunity or almost all the opportunity to prevent a death comes before someone has a cardiac arrest. Once they've had a cardiac arrest, really very few people survive. Even if you take them to hospital, they don't do very well. So wherever you had your first cardiac arrest, that's where we defined uh, where you died because that's where you really need the interventions to prevent that death happening. And this was interesting. So 77% of all the deaths happen during the pre-hospital phase of care and only 23% happened in the hospital. 
And then we went a step further. We went and said, okay, are the reasons for dying the same in the two places? Because a lot of assumptions you can make and uh, um, focusing your efforts. We had a look at that then. So at the, let's start on the bottom one here. This is the in-hospital death. So these are people who made it to hospital alive. They hadn't had a cardiac arrest, but they died in hospital. It's overwhelmingly central nervous system injuries. Okay? With a tiny bit of people of hemorrhage and a, and a small amount having made uh, a multi-organ failure. So just really those three causes in a hospital. Um, and the multi-organ failure is essentially people who've survived the hemorrhage, but then uh, having the cardiogenic failure leading to multiple organ failure. And we'll hear more about how we're tackling that group a little bit later. When we look at the pre-hospital deaths, significant difference in why people are dying. Okay, Nearly half are dying from bleeding, uh, much less dying from brain injury. Obviously, all the people that uh, um, are not compatible with life were in this group too. But I've ordered the order here from these first... Um, few groups are all the things we agree as potentially reversible. So your hypoxia, your tension pneumothoraxes, your cardiac tamponade, your bleeding. Uh, and you see, when you add all of that up, about just over half of all the deaths pre-hospital are preventable causes. Well, not preventable. They're like reversible causes is probably the right word. I'm not saying they're all preventable. It might happen long before we can get to these patients and intervene. But they're the kind of things that, if we do get there, we know how to treat them. And when you compare that to in-hospital, where it's only 6%, so it's almost an order of magnitude difference in how many reversible causes of death you see. Just to drive this home a bit more, um, if we look at our, our known uh, reversible causes of traumatic cardiac arrest, so hypoxia, tension, pneumothorax, tamponade, and hemorrhage, when we looked at them over this two years, so 100% of the deaths from hypoxia occurred during the pre-hospital phase. 100% of tension pneumothorax's deaths occurred in the pre-hospital phase. 100% of tamponades that died, died in the pre-hospital phase. And 96% of all people who died from hemorrhage died in the pre-hospital phase. And if we look at one particular group we're interested in, as Sammy said, we see a lot of penetrating trauma between a third and a half of our work. 80% of all the hemorrhage deaths were from penetrating trauma and 95% of them are dying pre-hospital. So if you're going to die from being stabbed or shot in London, that death is almost certainly going to be happening because of hemorrhage and during the pre-hospital phase. So if we want to do anything about that group, you know, basically, if you, if you were stabbed and you got to hospital alive, you made it. The final uh, thing we looked at uh, was the timing of these deaths. For the pre-hospital deaths, we timed the timing in, in minutes, so how many minutes it took until you had a cardiac arrest, and the in-hospital deaths is in days, like how many days were you admitted for before you died. And this is the overall um, graph. So you can see very similar to that, um, what Dimitriadi showed. So this is the pattern of deaths you see in an organized, well-functioning trauma system. Your deaths are unimodal and very left-shifted uh, early deaths. Uh, everything in the dark gray are the deaths that are happening in the pre-hospital phase, and then the, the white boxes are the ones happening in hospital. Now, from that very first important study um, by Trunky and his team, you know, they, had the, they called that first phase the immediate deaths, and this was usually down to catastrophic brain injuries and disruptions of major arteries. And the assumption is that they happen immediately and they're unfixable. But actually, most people are alive for some time after the injuries, a few minutes at least. And there's actually quite a group here that die pre-hospital, but they're alive for more than 15 minutes before they arrest. So we feel that certainly that group and maybe a chunk of this group is potentially possible for us to get to and make a difference in them. But just those two groups together, if we took that group and a third of that group of quarters, more than all the in-hospital deaths added together. The second thing, uh, we had a little bit of a deeper look into part of this. So this uh, is my last graph, but basically what I'm showing here, this violin plot plots the time from the point you were injured to when you go into cardiac arrest for those pre-hospital deaths, right? So you can see uh, these are where the, the patients die. And these lines here, are, that's the median and the intercortical range. And this gray bar is when we arrive as London's Air Ambulance. Okay? That's, our median is usually about 20 minutes after injury with our, our range. 
And actually, there's two things that are important to take away from this picture. One is that trauma deaths happen very early, so the median time is about 13 minutes after injury that people are going into cardiac arrest. But the other thing is, actually, this is showing how effective we are. When we arrive, hardly anyone arrests anymore. So that's showing how effective, and it's, and it's the same for the in-hospital stuff. Once you're in hospital, we don't see those later deaths anymore. It's because, you know, the care we get, that we can actually deliver is effective. My conclusions from this is where we want to go in the future is getting to patients quicker. If we can just get a little bit quicker, even three minutes quicker, all these people are not going to arrest and will potentially survive. Okay. So that's, I think, where we can make the biggest difference. Um, the second thing is to get patients to hospital quicker. We know that if you get patients to hospital in under an hour, they have much better chances of survival. And that's dealing with all this hemorrhage and that and, and, and stopping bleeding and how important that is. And finally, we do need pre-hospital interventions that are effective at either preventing or resuscitating traumatic cardiac arrest. Uh, and that's what a lot of our work is on and you'll hear about today. So thank you for your time.